Now, <clears throat> we left off at the end of a chapter, ready to start a new chapter. But let me just review where what we read. The last part of what we read last time, uh, brother and sister Slaybaugh were visiting friends. And the friends had um, let a rumor come into their home and have a, a room, a bedroom um, in their home. And this person was uh, someone who had studied for the Catholic priesthood. And they, the friends had asked the sleigh boss not to share anything controversial. But somehow they got into a discussion and um, the... They were talking about infant baptism versus immersion. Uh, and so the last part of the chapter said, Did you say all Protestants are doing these things? Rose Slaybaugh asked. All except one little denomination. Who could that possibly be? I asked. The Seventh-day Adventist. I said, oh, oh, oh. His face turned red, and he asked, Are you Seventh-day Adventist? I said, Yes, sir, brand new ones. I would have st stuck my neck out. I thought you were all Presbyterians, but good for you. Seventh-day Adventists are the only denomination in existence that is living according to the way the Bible teaches it takes men and women of courage to live according to the teachings of the Bible. I said, brother, if you know so much, what are you doing about it? But that's another story, one that we can't go into now. Go into now, she wrote. When Roy and I reached home, we wanted to get out and share our new faith with others. We thought we would like to hold some meetings, we asked Pastor Nightingale, about it, and he said, Go, by all means, with my blessings. You have my prayers. And now we start the next chapter. Sometime later, Roy and I decided that we would like to go out alone, with the Lord's help, to do missionary work. We had always lived inland and had never seen the ocean, so we decided we would like to go out to the Pacific coast. We leased our farm, stored our furniture, and said goodbye to all our new friends. We left Spokane the last of February and drove to Portland, Oregon, and then southward. Every little town we came to, we stopped and inquired, <laughs> just like the pioneers. Is there a Seventh-day Adventist church here? The answer was almost always yes. Finally, we were 350 miles south of Portland at Gold Beach, Oregon, at the mouth of the Rug River. We asked if there was a Seventh-day Adventist church there and found that there were only two churches, a Catholic church and a community church. There was no Seventh-day Adventist there. Roy and I decided that this would be the place to stop for a while. We rented a pretty little house on the north bank of the river. Gold Beach proper is on the south side of the river. We also bought a small tract of land about four and a half miles south of town. One day after we had been there several weeks, I said to Roy, Do you know that we came down here to do missionary work, and we haven't done one thing about it. <clears throat> I've been thinking about that myself. Perhaps we'd better start in. But how should we start? Rose, down here, we don't know anyone. <laughs> Let's start today, I said. I'm going to call on our neighbor that lives across the way. What are you going to say to her? Oh, I said, don't worry about that. I'll find something to say. We had prayer. And then Roy said, you run along, and while you're gone, I'll be praying for you. I knocked at her door, introduced myself, and started to apologize 
and she started to apologize for not calling on me. That's all right. We're just a little bit lonely here, I said. I just wondered if you have any fancy workbooks or crochet patterns that you would lend me. No, she said. I don't do anything like that, but come on in and sit down. That was all I wanted. I hurriedly looked around the room to see if I could tell what church they might belong to. On a little table just within reach was a beautiful new Bible. I could hardly keep my hands off of it. We talked of this and that, and finally I reached out and said, What a beautiful new Bible you have here. Yes, she said, isn't it pretty? Charlie just got it for me for a Christmas present. I did have an old Seventh-day Adventist Bible around here, but after Charlie bought my new one for me, I gave it to an old man up the river who had always wanted a Bible. I didn't think it would hurt him. It never hurt us any. I said, was that Bible any different from this one? No, she said, not one bit different, not a word different. We used to compare the two. Then she told me that she called it a Seventh-day Adventist Bible because she had purchased it from a call porter who was a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, I said, I don't think they're any different. In fact, I know they're not different. Are you people church members? I haven't joined any church, church yet. I haven't decided which one I'm going to join. Charlie just joined the Presbyterian Church. He was baptized not long ago. Isn't that nice, I said. We're new Christians also, and we're studying the Bible. Wouldn't it be nice if we could study together? That would be nice. How would it be if we started tonight? <laughs> Don't you love Rose? I asked, could you come over tonight? Oh, we'd enjoy that. I said, you come on up tonight and we'll have a study <laughs> on baptism. I knew how that man had been baptized. <clears throat> Hadn't I been a member of that church myself at one time? I added, bring Midge along with you. Midge was their teenage daughter. We never could get Midge interested in Sunday school, my neighbor answered. And now she's going to graduate from high school and she's planning to be married. All she can think about is dancing and parties and having a good time. We had several prayer meetings that afternoon, for we were starting all alone. We prayed that God would send his Holy Spirit to help us to be tactful and give the message in its true light. By evening, we were all ready for them. We had the screen and the projector and a pictured Bible study already. After studying from the Bible, we turned the lights out and had one with the film strip. When Rory turned the lights back on, our neighbor looked at his wife and said, Why, Esther, that minister over there didn't tell me the truth about baptism. I haven't been baptized at all. The Bible says plainly that we must be put clear under the water. At first, it was a little difficult to get Midge interested in the Bible. She had a few studies with us and then gave it up. She was a typical girl and one of the most popular ones in school. She was planning to be married. She didn't have time for religion. She was planning... Um, all of this, but then something happened. She came up to the house one day and say, Miss, said, Mrs. Slayball, will, will you please forgive me for treating you the way I have lately? Why, Midge, what have you been doing to me? You know that I've been ignoring you. But would you please give me Bible studies again? And so we started all over again with her. It wasn't long before Midge was baptized. When her fiancé found out that she had taken up religion, he wasn't too sure. 
about marrying Midge. He still wanted Midge, but she said, You can never have me without my religion, because my religion is my life. Can you believe that? A teenage girl in high school said that. That's wonderful. But going on, those are my words, going on. Of course, Midge felt bad when she gave him up. She came up and told me all about it. I said, now, honey, don't feel too bad about this. We'll pray about it, and perhaps the Lord will send another young man into your life. It wasn't long before Midge came running up to our little home, all excited. Oh, Mrs. Slaybell, I've met another young man, a brother of one of my school chums. He's just been discharged from the army, and he asked me out for a date. Do you think it would be all right for me to go out with him? Midge, don't come and ask me those things, I protested. Ask your mother. Mother doesn't know what I should do. Well, then, I said, I'll talk to you like I would if you were my own daughter. How would that be? That's just what I want. This young man isn't a Christian, is he? Oh, no, he, ha he doesn't know anything about the Bible. The Bible has never been permitted in his home. Midge, what would the Lord say about this? You know, in 2 Corinthians six fourteen, he tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? I know that, and that's what I'm worried about, Midge answered soberly. What am I going to do about it, dear? He will either drag you down to his level, or you can bring him up to yours. Now, how about that? Oh, her eyes danced, and she said, if it's left up to me, I'll have him right where I am. I'll start teaching him what I've learned. So Midge invited Bud to come to our house, and we started Bible studies with him. He understood readily and took a great interest in the studies. Then he started reading for himself, and it wasn't too long before he also was baptized and joined the church. Then the two young people were married. In their home in Gold Beach, church services were held for a long time. We continued with our Bible studies. I would call from door to door, inviting the folks to come and study with us. I found many people who were interested in the teachings of the Bible, but had no one to help them out. Night after night, every night in the week, they came and until we couldn't crowd any more into our living room or into the house. Then we asked Pastor C.A. Scriven, who at that time was president of the Oregon Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, to send us some help. This he willingly did. He arranged for Pastors H.D. Strever and W.D. Blim and their wives to come and hold meetings. We secured a large hall over a store building from a Mr. Leith. It was a nice place, and Lee, he let us have the building without any rent. The Lord richly blessed in those meetings because it wasn't long until we could organize a little church of 18 members. This was the kind of work we were doing when tragedy struck our home the second time without a moment's warning. It happened on Sunday, August 19, 1945. At nine o'clock in the morning, two boys, 15 and 19 years old, had left their home near Chicago and started out on a life of crime which was to end in the Oregon State Penitentiary. They had arrived in Gold Beach, looked the little town over, and waited until the early mornings, early hours of the morning. 
They picked out the store they were going to rob, a ready-to-wear establishment. They broke the glass in the door and gained entrance. When they had their car loaded and were ready to go on south, something happened. There was a bakery shop next door, and the baker had come down early to start the ovens. He heard a commotion next door through the partition, discovered what was going on, and gave the alarm. The boys were arrested and placed in jail. They had several guns in their car, and one of the boys had concealed a tiny pistol in his shirt sleeve. This gun was overlooked by the officer. The following morning, the boys held up the sheriff when he went into the jail to talk to them. Taking his car keys and gun and tying him up and locking him in the jail, they jumped into his car and started south. The sheriff knew they couldn't get very far. There is only one highway down the coast with the ocean to the west and the mountains to the east. The boys started south. Then they turned around and started north again, soon catching up with a new Pontiac driven by an elderly man. The boys were driving with authority for there was a siren on the sheriff's car. They drove up behind the Pontiac, sounded the alarm. The boys jumped out, ordered the people out of the car, and drove off, leaving the sheriff's car behind. They were now disguised in the second car, traveling north, going toward Gold Beach again. By this time, the sheriff had called a passerby for help and had been let out of jail. The alarm had been given, a posse formed, and all the highways blocked. The coast highway is very crooked in that section of the country, and about 30 miles an hour is as fast as one can drive safely. But right in front of the tract that we bought the road that we bought, the road straightens out for about a mile and a quarter, and going north is slightly downhill. At the end of this straightaway there is a very sharp curve to the right around a ravine. Some of the officers had already reached the Weimar place, inquiring if they had seen anything of the lads. The Weimers are Seventh-day Adventist friends of ours who had moved to Gold Beach. Just then the boys drove past at a terrific speed. The officers told us later that they must have been going 85 or 90 miles an hour. Fred Weimer shouted, Officer, I don't know who you're after, but if I were you, I'd take after that car. No, said the sheriff, we're not after anyone in a Pontiac. We're after two boys in my car. Nevertheless, Weimer shouted again, the way those people are driving, they're going to kill someone. Just then, they heard a crash. While the foregoing events were taking place, Dad Weimer had come to our place and asked Roy if he could help them get their power saw ready for work. Roy is always happy to help his friends whenever he can, so he got ready to go thinking I was going with him. But I said, I must stay home this morning and do a little work. I'd like to work in the garden a little while and perhaps do a little canning. Well, he said, I'll run along and you plan to go with me this afternoon. I'll be home at one o'clock for lunch. You're, you plan your work so you can go with me and we'll work and visit and have a good time. I said, all right, that will be fine. Since we had become Christians, we never started a day's work or journey without first getting down our, on our knees and asking God's watch care over us. We had our worship before Roy got ready to go, so he left the house. He took just a step or two and came back, thinking he had forgotten the car keys. I said, no, you have them. <clears throat> oh, yes, I've got the keys. 
But he came into the house and said, Rose, have we had our worship this morning? Why, I said, don't you remember? Yes, we have. Well, I was just thinking about it, he said. But let's kneel again and ask God to watch over each of us. So there, in our tiny little kitchen, we knelt and again asked God's watch care over us. With this, he left the house again. Down the little lane he went to where he parked the car. I watched him as he stood there for a moment or several moments with his hand on the door. Then he slowly turned around and came back to the house. What is it this time, dear? I asked. He came all the way into the house and said, Rose, what did you say you were going to do this morning? And I told him. He said, I wish you wouldn't do anything this morning. Come in the living room here. Sit on the Davenport or Davenport and watch the boats go down the river. I sensed that he was worried about something. I said, Roy, are you worried about anything this morning? No, I'm not worried about myself, but I, I never like to leave you behind. We stayed pretty close to one another since we had lost Jack. He had a premonition that something was going to happen, but he thought it was going to happen to me. You better run, run along now, Roy, I said, or we won't either of us get anything done. With that, he was gone. This was about nine o'clock in the morning. As he was slowly driving around the dangerous outer curve, I have mentioned the boys suddenly appeared, driving at a terrific speed. They crashed into the front left-hand corner of our car, and those cars just doubled around one another. In our travels all over the United States, we have seen many automobile accidents, but we have never seen a car more demolished than the one the boys were driving that morning. It was nothing but a mass of wrinkled metal and broken glass, and yet the two boys managed to crawl out of it. Our car was also demolished, but with Roy it was a different story. He was taken to the hospital badly injured. I, meanwhile, was busy all morning. At one o'clock, I had lunch ready and was waiting for Rory. Soon, someone walked around the front part of the house. I looked through the window and saw it was Vicki Weimer and her father-in-law, Dad Weimer. I called for them to come in. Did you come with Rory? I asked. No. Well, I said, he'll be here in any, any minute, and then we can all have lunch together. Mrs. Weimer said, no, Rose, Roy isn't coming home. Oh, yes, he is. N no, Rose, she said. Roy got hurt. Did he in some way get mixed up with the saw? No. There were two boys who ran into him. Vicky, where is Roy? I asked, frightened. He's in the hospital. Is he badly hurt? I don't think so just a little bump on the head. I knew very well that people were not taken to the hospital for little bumps on the head. Wait just a moment while I change my clothes and I'll go back with you, I said. I felt something was wrong. No, she said, I mustn't wait now, Rose. The bus is due right now and Clyde will come. And I must be there when the bus reaches the station or he won't know where I am. Clyde was her husband, a minister, who was coming from Spokane to spend a few days vacation on the coast. I forgot all about, about Dad Weimer. He walked out and around the house. Hurriedly, I changed my clothes. <clears throat> I couldn't wait for anybody to come back and pick me up. I must get to Roy, so I left the house and walked down the little lane 
Then I looked back and saw Brother Weimer. I called him and said, Come, let's walk on over. I can't wait for anyone. He is usually a very talkative little man, but this time he didn't have one thing to say. He looked pale and frightened, and we walked along swiftly. It was quite a walk across the bridge, almost half a mile. We had reached the end of it when a bus passed us, and in just a few minutes the Weimers picked us up. As soon as we as soon we stopped in front of the Golden Beach Hospital, as I was getting out of the car, someone said to me, You may go in, the doctor is with your husband. Why hadn't they called me before? The accident happened in the morning, and now it was after one o'clock. During the war, doctors and nurses were scarce, and there was only one doctor along that coast highway for many miles. He was an elderly man and was kept busy almost day and night. On Sunday morning, he would drive many miles up the coast and then back into the hills to his ranch where he could have a little rest and recreation away from his busy office. There was not even a telephone out there. And that is where he was when the accident happened. His office nurse had to send a messenger to find him, and it was one o'clock when he arrived in town. The nurses did not want me at the hospital until he came. I stepped through the door into the small hallway. The first door to the right was open. I looked in. There were three or four beds all made up, but only one patient. He was lying in the bed nearest the door. I looked at him and recognized Roy. His head was all bandaged. The bed railings were up, and his hands were tied to them. At the foot of the bed was were his blood-soaked clothes and shoes. There was a man standing by his side, and when I stepped in, he backed away. I said, Are you the doctor? He was a very quiet man and very deliberate in everything he said. He nodded his head and said, Yes, I am. I walked over to him and took both of his hands in mine and said, Doctor, please tell me how badly is my husband hurt? Very badly. I can see that, but I mean, what are his chances for life? Mrs. Slaybaugh, you are asking me a very frank question. Doctor, I must have a frank answer. There are only two of us, and we're here alone. There are certain things to be thought of and planned. Of course, you should know, he agreed. I can't give you very much hope of recovery. Perhaps one chance in a million. I wondered how he could be so sure. I didn't think they had taken any x-rays yet. He must have sensed my thoughts and said, It's this way, Mrs. Slaybaugh. I just examined your husband's injuries. He has a compound fracture of the skull, and the cerebral, cerebral fluid is draining out of the left eye and ear. There is no possible way of stopping it. Then I must hurry and send for his people, I exclaimed. Yes, he said. Don't lose any time if you want them to get here. By the way, where do you live? Where do they live? Sorry. I said, some are near Spokane, others in Portland, and in some in Seattle. Don't send for them. Doctor, they love Roy, I protested. They would want to be here. Mrs. Slaybaugh, you haven't understood what I have said. Would you want these people to start down here on that long journey and arrive too late? Oh, will it be that soon? He said, why don't you call one of your relatives and let them tell the others 
and we'll wait a little while. And that is what I did. Then I looked over at the bed and asked him if it would be all right to talk to Roy. He said, it won't hurt him one bit, but he'll not hear a word you say because he's unconscious. I walked around behind the bed. There were perhaps three or four feet between the bed and the wall, and there was a window there. Roy looked so helpless, lying there, tied down. First, I untied the right hand, and then I wondered how I could get the railing down. I didn't know the mechanism of these beds, but I lifted it up and down it came. I was just untying the other hand when a lady in white stepped in. You can't do that, she warned. Why, nurse, is it necessary to have him tied down? What you are doing is dangerous. The first thing he'll do, although he is unconscious, will be to reach up and tear the dressings off his head. That, that could cause instant death. And I can't take that responsibility. Nurse, I begged, I have only one request to make. Please don't ask me to leave this bedside until it's all over. She said kindly, that's all right, Mrs. Slayball. You may stay as long as you want to, but we must put the railing up and we must tie his hands down. I was glad she insisted, for then I had something to lean over during those long, weary hours I stood there, and it was much better to have his hands tied, for he didn't realize what was going on. The hospital staff took wonderful care of him, and the nurses were all kind to me. That evening they brought in a special nurse for night duty. She stood on one side of the bed and I on the other, and finally morning came. This was Monday morning. Between nine and ten o'clock, the doctor came in and said, I see we still have our patient. Now we must do something. Would you like to call in your own physician? Oh, no, doctor. Our doctor is far away in Spokane. Is there anyone down here that you would like to call in? Yes, there is. As it happened, we had once spent a weekend in Crescent City, California, 70 miles away. We were lonely for church fellowship and had driven down there one Friday afternoon. We called at the minister's home and were invited to spend the night there. During our visit, the, they... Um, the minister told us about the wonderful doctor there and what a fine Christian man he was. I said, would you please call for Dr. F. M. Stump at Crescent City? We've never met him, but I'm sure he's a good doctor and he's a member of our church. Oh, yes, I'll be glad to call him. <clears throat> Dr. Stump and I have worked together on many cases. He went to the telephone and called and was told that Dr. and Mrs. Stump were out of town and would be gone for some time. <clears throat> Pardon me, he came and told me and asked, is there anyone else you would like me to call? No, Roy is your patient. Please do everything you can to save his life. Why don't you take him away from this little place out to some larger hospital where you can have better things to work with? He answered, we wouldn't dare move him in his condition, but I would like to have another doctor to help me. Several hours later, the door opened and in walked four professional people all in white. Two doctors and two nurses. I watched as they took the bandages off Roy's head, and when I saw the terrible wound in his forehead and the ear, which had been tucked up in the bandage, I was afraid I couldn't stand it. 
I had to get out into the fresh air, and as I went, I overheard the nurse saying, Doctor, what are you going to do with this ear? We'll sew it back on, and then he'll be all in one piece. It seemed hours until they were all through fixing him up. They had now taken x-rays showing the fractured skull and the broken jaw bones. The doctor seemed to avoid me as he went out to his car, but I followed him and said, Please, doctor, tell me, what did you find? Of course, Mrs. Slayball, you should know. As I told you yesterday when I first examined him, his skull is fractured and the cerebral fluid is still oozing out of his ear and eye. There's no way of stopping that. I repaired the wound in his forehead the very best I could. I sewed the ear back on, but don't worry about that. If he lives, we can get an artificial ear made for him. They make them out of plastic so natural looking you can hardly detect them from a real one. Both of his jaws are fractured, but I can fix that. I can wire his teeth together and they'll grow back quite natural normally. He hesitated when he told me about the eye, Mrs. Slaybaugh. The sight in the left eye is destroyed. Do you mean he'll be blind? No, I've examined the right eye, and it will be all right. But don't worry about that. If he lives, he can have an artificial eye made for him. I said, Doctor, we'll get along all right, but what about his mind? He didn't answer me. That night, they brought him another special nurse for night duty. She did not work at her profession all the time, but always responded to an emergency. Her name was Mrs. Jenny Schnaldow. Let me say that again. Mrs. Jenny Schneiden. Schneiden. Mrs. Jenny Schneiden. We stood together all night with our patient, she on one side of the bed and I on the other. Toward dawn, she said, Mrs. Slayball, don't you have any people? Don't you have any relatives? Oh, yes, especially Roy. He has many. Why aren't some of them here? Why are you here all alone? I told her the doctor had asked me not to send for anyone for a while. She said, I don't care what the doctor told you. You go ahead and um, call someone. Don't go through this alone. Go and call. Slip down to the telephone office about three blocks down the street and call someone now before I go off duty. I put on my coat and started out. Someone was opening the outer door. I waited a moment, thinking another patient was coming in, but no one came in. Again, I opened the door, and then I saw who it was. It was Roy's brother, Joe, and he wasn't alone. His two sons and one of the son's wives were there. My youngest brother also came about the same time, so I wasn't alone after all. Tuesday afternoon, Roy was near death. The membranes in his throat collapsed. He dropped his mouth open and started gasping for air. I said, nurse, what's the matter with his mouth and tongue? Didn't the doctor tell you about this? No, he never said there would be anything wrong with his mouth. It looked like it was full of coagulated blood. His tongue had swollen so much. It had been severely injured when he was thrown over the steering wheel. Later Tuesday afternoon, his fingernails began to turn dark and his face began to swell. I was praying. With almost every breath, I was asking God, please, not to take Roy away from me. But my prayers didn't seem to reach very much higher. Then the little low ceiling, why? 
How could I ask God to do that which was apparently impossible? We know better, don't we? It wasn't fair to God. The doctor had told me how critically injured Roy was and gave me very little hope for his recovery. I had overheard a relative whispering to someone in the little outer hallway. As soon as it's all over, I'll drive you home in my car so you can get your family in your car and go back to Spokane with us for the funeral. I also overheard one of the Weimers say, as soon as it's all over, we're going to take Rose home with us in our car. The nurse came in to me that afternoon and said, Mrs. Slaybaugh, have you thought about the funeral? Oh, no. Do you have a funeral home here? We have ambulance service. <clears throat> we'll take him as far as Coquille, Oregon. There's a railroad station there just in case you're not able to go along with him. Has anyone told you about your, have you told anyone your plans? No, I haven't. Be sure that he is taken back to Spokane and laid beside Jack in the Riverside Park Cemetery. I told her where they could find his dark suit and a new white shirt in the trunk at home. That afternoon I saw a man polishing a hearse. I knew who he was polishing that hearse for. With all this in the back of my mind, how could I ask God to do that which seemed impossible? Later that evening the Weimers came in again and asked me to go in their car with them for a drive. I said, please not now. I mustn't leave him. He's dying. Yes, Mr. Weimer said, but we'd like to talk to you. So I got in the car, and when we started driving, I said, Mr. Weimer, why has this thing happened to us? Why does God treat his children like this? First he takes our Jack away from us, and then we struggle along and find this wonderful truth and come down here to do missionary work. We left our home to come down here to do to this little town to work for the Lord, and we are winning precious souls for Christ's kingdom. Why does he treat us like this? Please, Rose, don't talk like that. Don't ask anyone that question. No one can answer it. The only thing I can say is perhaps the Lord is finished with Roy's work here on earth. All right, I'll try to understand, but please take me back to him. As I was getting out of the car, Mr. Weimer asked if I had thought about calling one of the ministers and having them pray for Roy and anoint him. I didn't understand what he was talking about. This was one doctrine that I did not understand. I remembered how we used to read about when Jesus was on earth, how he would go back about healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, and raising the dead, but that was when our Savior was on the earth, so I didn't understand what he was talking about, and he didn't say anything more about it. What a shame. I went back to Roy and stood again all night. At four o'clock Wednesday morning, I was standing with my back to the bed, looking out of the window into the darkness and wondering why this was happening to us. Wasn't there any help for me? I had a forsaken feeling about being all left all alone. I recalled the many promises in the Bible, especially the one in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Just then a nurse came in with a glass of water and two, two, two little white tablets. She said, Mrs. Slaybaugh, will you please take these now? The doctor had been wanting me to take something to make me sleep, but I said, no, thank you. There'll be plenty of time for me to sleep after this is all over. I thought they were the same thing, but she said, no, these won't make you sleep. They'll quiet your nerves and buoy you, buoy you up. The end is near. The end.
a tiny little word, only three letters, E-N-D. We can take a trip, we come to the end of it, but we can go again. This means something different, the end of a life. The end of the life of my beloved. We had had such a wonderful life together. This would mean the end of everything that ever meant anything to me on this earth. I thanked the nurse and told her I'd get along without anything. She went out of the room and I was alone with him for a few minutes. Something was working in the back of my mind. What was it? What was it that Mr. Weimer had said? Why hadn't I paid attention to it? He had said something about doing something, calling in somebody. I turned around, and there in the darkness of that room, the answer came to me. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of the faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. James 5, 14 and 15. It started then to darken and disappear. But brighter than ever it came back with an added line, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There it was. That was the solution to the whole thing. All I had to do was to reach out and take that promise as God had flashed it to me. I could hardly wait until morning. I called for Mr. Weimer. He came in and I asked him, What was it you said to me last night? He repeated it to me. I said, Hurry, hurry, do it. Roy is dying. We don't have much time left. He said, I'd like to have another minister with me. Shall I ask for Pastor Nightingale? Oh, no, he's in Portland. He's ten hours away. I would like to have another minister with me. I said, I know where you can get one. Call Pastor T.L. Thumler in Crescent City. I know he will come. Mr. Weimer went to the telephone and called, and yes, Pastor Thumler would come about noon. Noon? Would this little flicker of life last till noon? Then I did some telephoning myself. I called Nightingale, and he called me as soon as he heard about the accident to see if he should come or if he could do anything. When I reached him, I said, Pastor Nightingale, would you please have special prayer for Roy during the noon hour? He said he would. I called friends in Spokane and asked them to do the same thing. Then I called a little group of believers in El Rock, California, where we had spent several months. After making these calls, I went back to Roy and prayed desperately that God would spare his life. Just another few minutes, he would almost stop breathing, and then I would press on his chest and he would gasp for another breath. At 10 minutes to 12, the doctor stepped in on his way home for lunch. He picked up Roy's hands looked at the darkened nails and tenderly laid them down. Then he reached across the bed and patted me on the shoulder, and without a word he went out. About that time a car stopped out in front. It was Pastor Thumler here in time. I had not asked permission to have this done. I realized I had been given many privileges during the days that I was here, and I must not do anything wrong now. I ran up the hallway, turned the corner to the next corridor, and then came up to the nurse's quarters. They were all seated at the table, eating their lunch. I whispered to the head nurse, Is it all right? I called ministers to come and pray for Roy. Yes, that's all right, Mrs. Slaybaugh. We can't do anything more for him. I hurried back. The ministers came in and closed the door. There was Pastor Thumler, who was going to do the anointing. Pastor and Mrs. Weimer, my brother, Roy's brother, Joe, his two sons, the wife who had come with them, and Roy and I. They walked in and stood around. Are there any unbelievers in this room? Pastor Thumler asked. If so, would you please step out? 
I looked at our two nephews, tall, stalwart men of the world, both of them over six feet tall, but they didn't leave. He said, then we'll all kneel. They all knelt but me. I had something else to do. I took Roy's two dying hands in mine and held them up to God. There was not going to be any ceiling between God and us now, not a thing between us. If it was his will, he was going to reach down and take those hands I was holding up to him. Pastor Weimer prayed a beautiful prayer. It was a quiet, sincere prayer of faith. When he finished, Pastor Thumler began. Our Father, which art in heaven, he went on and pleaded with God. He asked God to spare this life that had been consecrated and dedicated to his work. When he came to that portion of the prayer where he said, And now I anoint thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, he poured the oil over his head and reached up and touched the only part of Roy's head that was not bandaged. And I know it's getting late, but I know you want to know what happens. We'll go. It's the end of a chapter. We'll read the first part of the next chapter. The instant that Pastor Thumler touched Roy's forehead, something wonderful, something terribly wonderful happened. There was a powerful shudder that started in the hands I was holding. And Roy trembled and shook all through his body. Then everything was still. Elder Thumler went on praying. I thought I must look and see what the Lord has done. I opened my eyes and looked at the hands I was holding, and the darkness was going out of the tips of the fingers, of the fingernails. They were pink and natural looking. Roy had closed his mouth over his swollen tongue and was breathing through his nose naturally. The swelling had started to recede. recede. First a nose took shape, then a mouth, then a chin, and then a throat. As the swelling left, all got up from their knees weeping. Pastor Thumler said, We'll all go out quietly now. Brother Slayball's going to be all right. He didn't say, I think he's going to be all right. But Brother, S Brother Slayball is going to be all right. And with that, he reached down and took hold of one of Roy's hands. And Roy gripped it and held it tight. Pastor Thumler has been with us many times as we have told our story. And he tells Roy, Brother Slayball, I'll never forget that handshake as long as I live. And we'll stop there. It's um, a time for us to share. We'll pick up next time, Lord willing, if you'll return and hear the rest of the story. As we've often said or heard, the rest of the story is coming. Okay, let's close with prayer, shall we? Father, we're so thankful that you reign in this universe, that you're the ruler of everything that happens on this earth, even though Satan is usurping as much as he can. But you are our Father, and Jesus is your Son and our Savior, and we praise your name for all the goodness you have given each one of us in our lifetimes. And we are thankful for this story of your miraculous power and intervention with Brother Slaybaugh. And we pray that um, you will heal us of whatever is um, afflicting us, whether it's a soul problem, a physical problem, a mental issue, Father, make us whole. We want to be whole and ready for the return of Jesus. So heal us also, we ask. And we surrender our lives to you, knowing that um, you work out all things uh, to your good pleasure, yes, but for our good also. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And yes, until we meet again, may God bless and keep you 
And thank Bye. you each one for joining. Bye for now.